We should give a shout out to them. We're, first and foremost, welcome back everyone. And just as Patrick and I were discussing, thank you so much for listening to this podcast. It's been an eerily dark moment, I think, for everyone in the entire world. Mm. And for me, and I, I'm sure for all of our listeners, this is the only shining light or beacon in society. And they've all been desperately waiting our return. And, and you're welcome, essentially. And it's it's fantastic to be back. We are You've been hounding us to return, <laughs> absolutely flooding our DMs, begging us to make the comeback. To, to, and to, finally, we will re- relent. To, to everyone that uh, did inquire as to how we were going when the next pod was coming, thank you so much. Mm-hmm. Um, a little bit of a delay. Patrick actually works hard and, you know, is a busy man. Mm. Um, and Lucas almost has too much time. It didn't so. feel it didn't feel right to do this part in a state of tranquility. Mm. So we've kind of found a medium now. To be fair, there was also a little while there when there was literally nothing to talk about. I Because a lot of the media flocked to, let's talk about the 90s and the 2000s mm. and let's do like revisionist content. Yeah, I was like, slight problem. Yeah. I was only alive for like a year and a bit there. So. <laughs> of, of the Jordan era. <laughs> I'm, not sure, I'm not sure what expertise I've got for you there, I'm afraid. Yeah. I did watch The Last Dance though. What did you think of The Last Dance? Thoroughly enjoyed it. Anyone who hasn't yet watched it, which I'm sure you have, I'm sure... Oh, if, you, has, if you listen to this podcast, you've watched The Last Dance, who, surely. Who has Netflix? Hmm. All thousands of you out there are surely uh, watching The Last Dance. We, we also want to give a shout out to Brendan, who actually about a month ago inquired as to whether we were covering the playoffs. Yes. And, and Brendan, we wanted to. The, the plan was to, but... Mm. Again, there was it's it's a wild time, but thank you so much for your support. Mm. Brendan's yeah. a Pelicans fan too, he so he is. probably turned off. Brendan once from the Sydney. playoffs started. Yeah, yeah, well, Brendan, we're sorry. Really. Brendan from Canberra. Is he from Canberra? He's moved to Sydney. Oh, mm. <laughs> how do you know that? I know Brendan. I'm friends with. Him. Oh, okay, that makes more sense. He's not just some. Because I was like, fan I was like Patrick, we can't put that in. <laughs> Did you just think he was someone? Yeah, I thought it was just someone that, from Sydney. It was just shout out to all the bots out there <laughs> <laughs> that, that we don't know who listen to this podcast. <laughs> I feel like I know you, <laughs> but Brendan, he he's real. He's a real person. Okay, well, yeah. well, thank you, Brendan, for inquiring. Yeah. And like, first and foremost, my condolences on what was one of the weakest bubble performances from any team but you did yes. make the bubble and that's that's yeah great. he also had to watch anthony davis absolutely destroy everyone he, in his path so. davis is an nba champion yeah tough time for brendan it's been a tough time for a couple of people really in the world and um we we do wish everyone well we hope wherever you are you're, you're safe and continue to be so and hopefully when all of this is over and we have the NBA back at some point, from what I'm hearing, it's going to be at least February, January. Wait, so you're officially reporting that from inside no, no, per, per I'm, league I'm, sources? I'm reporting that... from another report. Uh, I thought this was the Lucas bomb. Yeah, no, this isn't quite... L bomb? Yeah. Does that work better? No. LP bomb. But basically from all the reports mm-hmm. I am following, mm-hmm. it's it's a little way away. Yeah, so don't, don't miss us too hard. Yeah. We're not quite sure the direction of Between Buckets in the next couple of months. Um, as always, Patrick's a busy man. But this means a lot to us. Thank you, and please stay safe. Ditto. If, like Lucas and myself, you enjoy a side dish of written analysis to go with the main meal, which is this podcast, then you should head to betweenbuckets.com. On the site, you'll find feature articles looking at topics such as Giannis's MVP defense, a critical year for Ben Simmons, and our top 25 player rankings. Be sure to check it out as there are some contentious names challenging conventional wisdom and some familiar faces in declining places. Also, be sure to follow Between Buckets on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter for more updates and analysis. Back to the pod. Okay, Patrick, so in celebration of our return, I've thought of an interesting segment to open this pod with. And basically, I've asked you to write up eight takes from the season in its entirety. Although, from what I understand, you've focused on a 
particular. I primarily go on playoff teams because who the hell cares who wasn't in the bubble. That, I don't right. think anyone wants us talking about 20 minutes on how the Cavs are going to navigate having 16 centres on their roster. You're right. Hmm. And um, I and I and I don't know what you've written, except that you've probably not put the Cavs down there by the sounds of it. Spoiler alert: no, no, no Cleveland content. There are, there I'm afraid. In, there's no Cavs. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you'll have eight takes. I'll have eight takes. We each have ninety seconds to proffer our take, justify our take, maybe a little bit of back and forth. But here's the excitement for the segment: mm-hmm. if I fundamentally disagree with your take or vice versa. You can give up one of your takes to dispute mine. Mm-hmm. So that means a three-minute discussion in its entirety or just 90 seconds per take. Mm-hmm. Do you want to start off? Um, no, you go first. Wow, okay. Go for it. My first take, not really shocking, but I kind of want to push some emphasis on it. LeBron James has to be the best player in the game at the moment and for this season. And as, as someone who has... Previously advocated for Kawhi Leonard. I still have a lot of positive sentiments about him, but, you know, we've just got to pause on... It's it's LeBron. Like, there's been far too many back and forths in the media about, you know, he's slipped, he's top three, he's top five. Giannis, Kawhi, I mean, it's LeBron. He's finals MVP. That was my reasoning with Kawhi season earlier. And, I mean, just, you know, as someone that's been accused of being a hater in past years i'm in awe of the guy and it's it's incredible what he's done it is like do you here's a follow-up though do you think you know we both thought Kawhi Leonard was the best player in the game Mm. for well prior to the playoffs yeah do you think when you know we look back on this period in 10 20 years whatever history should reflect that Kawhi Leonard had overtaken LeBron for a while now or does LeBron coming back to number one so quickly does that kind of prove that maybe we were wrong? Or were we right back then? Well, I think... I mean, Kevin Durant, I think, for at least a season and a half, was was ahead of him mm. as well. But, you know, the thing with LeBron is in an effort to emphasise his longevity, he has taken regular seasons off. Mm. And, and that's where it really lies. I mean, you could look at that one playoff series between Kevin Durant and him, whereas just individuals, KD, outplayed him. With, mm. And that was crazy. But apart from that, I think it's a blur. And because of LeBron's just the majority of his dominance over this decade, it's it's not going to really stand out. So, so if somebody's told you that LeBron James was the greatest player for the entire 2010s, yeah. you don't dispute it particularly heavily. I'd say that there's maybe three out of the 10 seasons where he wasn't. Yeah. And that's that's. I'm happy point. to I'm happy to round that up to ten. He's been he's been pretty damn good, pretty damn good. Well, that's my ninety yeah. seconds. Over yeah, look, I, I look, I agree with that one. So I'm not gonna not gonna refute that one. My first take is that the Miami Heat have cranked open the championship window for five plus years, and essentially, I thought this is pretty. In one sense, it's sort of obvious, but when you look at championship windows for a lot of teams. Having one that lasts more than one or two seasons is actually, I think, more rare than people realise. Obviously, we looked, if we look at the 2010s again, you have Miami Heat had it in the first sort of part of the decade and the Warriors had it sort of a near five-year run as well. But I think with a lot of the free agent movements, uh, team trade, blockbuster trades, you know, uh, ebbs and flows and league injuries, we're not going to see that many teams have five plus years of a championship window. And I think Miami Miami have sort of really emerged as a team that we all liked in the Eastern Conference. Everyone thought they were pretty good. Few people, you know, recognize that they're a dark horse to make the finals. But I think now I have actually a lot more faith in their roster going forward as well. Because if you look at the age of these guys, I mean, Butler isn't young anymore. He's probably, he's probably right, you know, smack bang in the middle of his prime. But I was so impressed with guys like Bam, Hero, Robinson's going to be valuable that I think and the fact that they're actually one of the several like the only teams in the league which has cap space going forward and it's going to be an absolute you know superstar free agent destination looking at Giannis next year um, they're going to be in contention for five plus years which is pretty incredible yeah look I think there's there's a couple of complexities there but overall I would agree mm-hmm. I think contracts, you know, they're all shaped to getting Giannis mm. and they can probably make something work even if they don't and they've got a lot of young talent. Um, so, yeah. Not guaranteeing they'll win no, the no, titles, no. but they, the window is well it's, and truly open. It's looking good to be a Miami yeah. fan. And you wouldn't have said that at the start of this year. 
No, so, 100%. Incredible season. Yeah, no, I agree. My next take is that we need to rethink the in-game commentary because Ooh. it's getting ridiculous. <laughs> um, there, you know, I don't want to name names. Mark Jackson. And, and Gundy. Yeah. Um, look, first and foremost, incredible basketball minds, both reputed coaches. Don't know what goes on when they get in the booth and start watching basketball and feel and, you mm. know get paid to talk about it. Yeah. But it's getting to the point where we're, in, we're watching slow-mos of replays of fouls and either they're reaffirming that it's a foul when my eyes can watch the hand slap the person in the face and make that contact. <laughs> they're saying, that's a bad foul. And I'm like, yeah, it is a... I know, it, yeah. It's a bad foul. <laughs> it's, it's... <laughs> or they go into these tangential philosophical debates about the essence of refereeing and how we need to change the game. And we are notably haters of tangential philosophical rants, aren't we? There's, there's, this, <laughs> there's this... We've never been known to do that ourselves. I don't know. I just feel like in the last three or four years, there's a couple of commentators that believe that the entire audience is stupid mm. and they have to reaffirm things that any empirical sense can really just help the viewer figure out for themselves. Haven't even mentioned like Chris Webber yet, who I think is the worst commentator in all of sports. Look, he is atrocious. Yeah, you're right. They, they completely overstate the obvious. They speak to you like you're a 10 year old watching your first basketball game and, you know, just get Doris Burke in there. It's, they've, got, they've got the talent. It's a quick fix. Yeah, get her commentating some finals game. She's the best analyst in the league. Yeah, look, I'd, I'd be more than happy with, with Doris Burke. Mad shout out to her. Anyway, over to you. Um, my second take is that Super Small Ball is dead. Um, and I, for one, am not mourning its loss. The Houston experiment is over. But I'm not just looking at Houston, actually. I also wanted to talk about the Celtics and how... You know, I wouldn't call there's a super small ball experiment, definitely not on the scale of the um, of Houston, but both teams showed that they desperately need some kind of centre in order to be a functional lead team. You look, you look at the final four teams, the, the conference finalists, you have obviously Lakers, Nuggets, Celtics, Heat, three of which had a very well, an elite big man in Davis, Jokic, and Adebayo. And I think that was a really critical part of their success. I mean, you look at the Lakers, their size was one of their biggest factors, which led to their success. And not everyone's going to have an all-world generational type talent like Davis. But teams like Houston just couldn't keep up. They couldn't keep teams off the board. And when you're banking on you know three, making X amount of three-pointers every game, that doesn't really hold up in the playoffs, and we have years of evidence to suggest that. And I have have always had complete respect for what Murray has done with Houston, what he's tried to do. I think somebody sort of had to do it. And I actually, obviously, they were a couple of years ago, they were super close to actually to throwing the Warriors when everyone else was kind of taking that period off. And I completely respect what they've done. And I actually like how he gave up on Capella as well. I said, you know, he's picked a strategy. He's, you know, not holding back he went all in on the capella deal but unfortunately it just hasn't worked and i think super small ball is dead small ball still remains but he still needs some kind of functional center to be able to throw at guys like the generational talents like your davis your Jokic, i think out of bio and maybe him if you can ever get healthy Giannis as well if you can have an anchor that's probably pretty helpful mm. no i don't disagree so much as i think um yeah Super like the micro ball stuff's never going to work because the playoffs are just too slow. Like mm. the scores went real down. It's beautiful. It's like a shout out to two thousand and seven. Mm. Some of those <laughs> finish lines. Yeah, big guys like that. Like it's offensively it could work, but defensively, like big men are going to eat at the line in Not the free throw line against these teams. And it's just I know um, Celtics were pretty successful. I mean, they got Eastern Conference Finals was pretty good and they got reasonably close, but they desperately, and I like ties, but they, they need a big man. Yeah, no, absolutely. So my next take is that Jimmy Butler proves that we need to reassess how we evaluate superstars and I guess their stock in the league. For example, going in, I think we've put him in, at the, in oh, last season or this season at 12th, 13th. There's now 
five guys that aren't ahead of him, in my eyes at least. Maybe four. I'd have to double check a couple of different things. But I think there is this intangible quality that is mindset, mentality, and also just, I think, place in rotations. You know, Jimmy Butler is, is perfect for what the Heat are trying to do. And, and it was just incredible watching him literally take on LeBron James, who at worst is the second greatest player of all time in multiple games. And, you know, either outplay him or match him. And, like, how many other players alive with, you know, in the game right now could have done that? Very few. Yeah, and I think it's crazy how, for a final series, he was that good. He averaged 26 points per game mm. in, a, in a NBA Finals against LeBron, with LeBron guarding him for... And, and AD guarding him for different games. So... I don't know where he is because there's like there's problems with putting him any higher or any there's yeah there's problems there's problems with putting him any lower than 7 mm. but at the same time there's his intangibles are incredible mm. and I just couldn't help but think you know Harden who's like you know been a perennial top 5 player in the game at worst top 6 I don't know if I'd want Harden over Jimmy Butler in a finals Oh I definitely want Jimmy then, Butler And right that's now. the yeah. problem Yeah Harden's been the spear player for years, I know. especially in the regular season. But after what we've seen this year, I don't think anyone could say that they'd rather have James Harden. Yeah, right and what's frightening is... Even to, to be fair, I think if James Harden was in the East mm. for the past few years, he, 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 he would have done better. And he yeah. probably could have made it to the finals at least. Mm. I mean, he, he was his sort of peak years were going right up against the Golden State Warriors peak yeah, years, it, which, is, which is rough. But yes, I, I would still rather... But, it, and it's, but it's also like, even Giannis, you know, and I'm not saying I would rather... Yeah, uh, Jimmy Butler over Giannis because for the full regular season and at least the first playoff round, Giannis is going to give you mm. effectively unbeatable performances. But clutch closing out, rugged playoff basketball. Butler's incredible for it. Anyway, that's that's something that was on my mind. Well, my next take actually feeds a little bit off that um, on Giannis. So my take is that Giannis is no longer the golden boy of the NBA. He's thrown has been succeeded by someone who I'll talk about in my next take. But it just clearly follows this superstar trajectory that we've seen over and over again when they come into the league, they're either... In Giannis's case, he was raw and it took him a couple of years. But they get to the stage where I would call the golden boy of the NBA. This is usually where you rack up your MVPs, your um, all-star selections, all NBAs. And everyone seems to be on your side. Like, everyone sort of liked and appreciated Giannis's game so much more throughout this season. You know, he was, you know, clearly the MVP. But how the, quickly the narrative can switch where he's going to be hammered from now on, I think. Because the Milwaukee Bucks and he drastically underperformed relative to expectations. And it's that similar trajectory where, you know, you can compare it to LeBron in a way where he, you know, started off exploding, racking up all these awards, but then it gets to a point where you have to start winning. And Giannis has got a, Giannis and the Bucks have a long way to go there. So I think, I think in the next year you're going to see a lot more critical headlines about Giannis. Yeah, I I don't disagree, but I think we should dedicate out in a couple of extra seconds to this. Mm. I think it's not only do or die for Miami. Uh, sorry, for Milwaukee mm. in terms of free agency retaining him, but. Also, like, yeah, he's, he's, the way he's perceived in the league, he's mm-hmm. going to fundamentally <laughs> experience different perceptions, intense criticism if he mm-hmm. can't live up to... Or if he doesn't make the finals this, this coming season, like, it's, mm-hmm. it's a different game. He, oh, he's the number one storyline next yeah, year he in falls. terms of an individual because it being that in a contract year, you know, there was a little bit of buzz that he was going to request a trade. That doesn't seem to be happening. It no, seems like he's given him the, the Bucks one more year. And I think if they if they don't make the finals next year, he's he's gone. Well, I mean, there, there's problems in that. Even they need to sign him to an extension mm. because if they play out that year, they're losing an incredible asset that they're never going to get back. Mm. So I think it's even up to trading him, really. If because yeah. if he doesn't, if he doesn't, and you can debate this all you want, but if he doesn't resign this off season with his extension, I mean, there will definitely be talks of trades. I mean, and I get like go for one more ring, try and win mm. him over, but. 
regardless, things are changing in Milwaukee. And mm. I 100%... Like, he will fall from finals MVP to the, to the, to the Robin. You know, he'll mm. go from the Batman characterization to he's Robin and can't win unless he has a clutch shooter that's better than him. Yeah. Anyway, that's a great take, Patrick. My next take is that if you have Kyrie Irving on your team, a championship isn't looking so great. <laughs> and there's a couple of ways I want to go about this. One, injuries. Mm. Dude can't stay healthy. I feel like objectively any Kyrie fanatic's not going to dispute that. Yeah, I feel like I haven't watched Kyrie Irving play in years. Yeah, which is obviously wrong, but he's been so up and down, back and forth. Not great. Like, no, he, uh, he's Boston, every Boston him. season, mired mm. by in- injury. Uh, Cleveland was never fundamentally healthy. Mm. Brooklyn played 20 games. Mm. So there's the health side of things where I feel like everyone's on the same page because it's just objective games played. And then there's the, I don't think we'll really have a head coach next oh, season. That comment. There's, there's, <laughs> there's the Earth's flat. There's the... Um, Earth's flat. I could go on an hour the, defending that. <laughs> there's not that I'm a flat earther, <laughs> but I have a lot of thoughts on that. But don't get me onto that one. But the coaching comment. I think oh. I sent that to you like the second I saw it because it's the most like quintessentially Kyrie yeah. take that I've ever heard. And I was thinking, bloody hell, I'd hate to be Steve Nash if right there now. Were, if there were, if you could find a manifestation of postmodernism mm. in the basketball world, it's Kyrie Irving. <laughs> yeah. Like he, his aloofness. The fact that you can't actually predict anything that he's going to say or do, so, like premier basketball talent, and I and I respect his abilities on the basketball court, but I don't like the way he handled Boston, just his locker room presence. What seems to be a detrimental impact in that respect, in conjunction with the fact mm. that his knees, his shoulders, everything's giving up. I don't think you can win if he's your second best yeah. player on a championship team. The only counter argument there would be Kevin Durant is so good. Yes. That it can either bring out the best in Kyrie Irving, which I'm skeptical of, or it negates all this negativity. I, but just, that, I think that's a, that's a big time stretch. That's my take. Yeah. Over to you. Um, so building off my last take, last take was um, Giannis is no longer the golden boy. <laughs> the new golden boy is obviously... Do I have a guess? Um, Derek Favors. No. I haven't thought about Derek Favors in a long time, though. Um, Spider. No, he had a... He ben had a, Simmons. It's not Ben Simmons. <laughs> I've got more thoughts on him. Because <laughs> you know, and all the listeners know, I'm not doing a podcast about Rondo? talking about Ben Simmons. Is it Rondo? Rondo? Because that's me. Because you go from like out mm. of the league almost to Rondo's back. It's um, He had a pretty good first round exit. Um, yeah. It's, uh, Is this a certain Euro it's, Finals MVP? It's, it's Luka Doncic. Yeah, no surprises. Um, but more so, I think, you know how we were talking about before about players that come in and they explode and then they start racking up the awards? Yeah. I think that's Luka's, Luka's phase now. And then, obviously, in a few more years, if he doesn't win a ring, then he's going to hit an impasse like Giannis just did mm. and he's going to go down again. But right now, he's going way up. I was so... Everyone was so impressed with the Mavs for taking it to the Clippers like that. But no one ever thought, myself included, that they're actually going to beat the Clippers. So I was never persuaded of that. But to even push, to make that a series, and what he did against what we thought at least was an elite defense, especially in the perimeter, was incredible. And if you want something a little bit spicier as well, I think Luka Doncic's ceiling is, we're talking top 10 to 15 all-time type player. And to give you an idea about the magnitude of such a statement. In the game right now, there's probably two or three players that are going to be top 15 when all said's done that have five years or more of, under their belt. Yeah. I'm thinking LeBron, KD, either Steph or Kawhi is all I can really... Th- and Steph or Kawhi... Maybe Giannis, probably- actually, because he's now got five years. But you get what I'm saying. I, I think he's going to be that good. The fact that he's already doing this at 21, and he's actually... He answered, not answered, but he pushed a few of my concerns. I thought his defense is going to be a big limitation for him. It's still not his strength, but I thought he actually tried a little bit harder in the playoffs and was actually pretty impressive. But I think the biggest reason I think so, other than his like phenomenal talent and resume already, is that I think he's coming in at 
coming into the league and taking off at literally the perfect time. I think his skill set completely complements today's NBA and the style. I think he's going to have a team built around him in order to maximize his talent for the next decade. Mm. And this is all this is saying is I like I don't even rate Porzingis that highly compared to a lot of he other can't people. Walk. Yeah, he literally he is, a, he is an right injury now. liability. Seven, and we wish him well. Seven foot three is like just too big. I've just got so many injury concerns, and he's yeah. phenomenal. I watched him live, unbelievable. Mm. Love Porzingis. Mm. I don't think he plays a proper season. Yeah, um, neither. For the next couple of years, anyway. And I know I like the Mavericks role players as well, but there's no, no. stars there. I just think Doncic is an all worldly talent. If if Cuban and Carlisle can build and operate the successful team around him. His ceiling is sky. High. Also, he's like twenty. It's twenty one. Twenty one. Like, which so it, it makes no sense for me to tell you you're an idiot. Yeah, I'm, I'm comparing him to other like twenty one year olds. Like he was all think... NBA second or first team this year. First, first I, think. I think. I mean, like it makes no sense for me to tell you anything, yeah. but you could be right. Like halfway through the regular season, way back when, like there was MVP discussions, and it was some legitimate. legitimate thing. I knew he wouldn't win. Yeah, no but... one's gonna get Derrick Rose, but. Um... <laughs> But um, <laughs> let's not talk about Derek Rose. Please. We got him in there, though. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I think he's got to be in the conversation for like way too early MVP predictions for next or year. Or just way too early after. Hall of Fame predictions. He's, I, he's incredible. Yeah. I love watching him play. No, I, I back that. I think it's now time to consider the fact that traditional superstar pairing is not the only blueprint for championship success. And I point to the Spurs, 2014. And what I mean by Amen. a superstar... Amen. Hold up, hold up. What I mean by a superstar is not a top 10 player. Because I think it's a, it's a, blurry, it's a blurry line where is it the top 20. I think it's, it should be top 5, but it is top 10. And what I mean, So I think you can potentially win a championship with, without a top 10 player in the league. Ooh. Yeah. Really? Yeah. I might have to use my flag on this one. Just because if you look at the Spurs, they so they did it six, seven years ago, and mm. they didn't have a top 10 player that year. And if you look at them, the Mavs is a fringe because Dirk was still probably seven-ish or up. And then you look at the Pistons. D- Dirk was unbelievable that he year. He was good. Unbelievable. He, he was, was definitely good. top 10 that year. Yeah. But I was, he was not top five. Um, but what, what are you basing it? What did you see this year? Which could be... I, mean, I, mean, imagine, the it's the, I imagine it's the heat. The heat. I mean, Butler now... The thing is, Butler, Butler played himself into top 10. I guess. But at this, and it, it kind of comes into contradiction with my last take. And but they not, didn't win. But, he's, but, he, but they also weren't healthy. And I'm saying, mm. but contention now... Like, if you give mm. me a solid top 10 to 15 or a solid top 7 to 15 player, I'm not... That can close. You know, Butler has that mentality... I'm not going to dispute the chances. Like, look, if you have a if you have Eric Spolstra, a top three coach, if you have an all star, bam, and Dragic, a former all star, if you have role players, if you have an egalitarian system that plays beautiful basketball, I don't know. Watching the Heat at full health, I'm not saying they would have beaten the Lakers. I I thought they would before that Dragic injury happened, but I like I do think there's going to be some creative designs where some teams will realize we can't get a top five, top seven player in free agency. Let's build around a good coach and just like promising traits that could maybe translate to a championship. I think there's something in that. I think it's like, as you mentioned, history shows us that it's plausible that these teams win, but I don't think that's the blueprint now. I mean, if we look at what happened this year, the Lakers won because they're two of the I three. Not off- the only blueprint. Yes, it it is a blueprint. Because I think the but way it's, it's I feel like that is so so rare to strike to find a team without a top ten, top eight, whatever you want to call a player. Yeah, and I'm changing build, it to top seven. Changing it to top seven. Yeah. All right. <laughs> you need a lot of luck and I think you need to find a lot of players at perfectly the right time for their yeah. careers willing to sacrifice because obviously if you don't have a top 7 player you're assuming that you have a lot of you know you have a closer good, that's a good, top 20 player yeah. yeah and then from there you have a very deep and supporting bench who are all lining up at the right time like, beating that that Spurs team is a players like Ginobili it Parker was, and Duncan was, still effective were taking pay yeah. cuts um, it's just it, Would it, that's you, so impossible to line up I think what this year showed is if you get two Phenomenal. Top five. Top yeah, if five, you get two top even five. top three or four, really, now players. Yeah. And have. It's over. And try and like money ball it around those two players with this band of misfits. Mm. You can win. 
But would you concede that in the increasingly polarizing three-point revolution that is the NBA today, mm. it's more likely now that if you can really hone into efficient basketball winning strategy mm. with those role players, a closum, an all-star, you, you, you can contend for me. Oh, yeah, you can do, and some, that's, you and can that's, do some damage and I, put yourself in the mix. And, and, and the, heat, the Heat, looking at their numbers, like, I mean, you've given me your 90 seconds, so I think I'll just expand a little bit. If you look at the numbers... There, Sorry, Portland, you'll take it. <laughs> the, the Heat failed. They, they ranked first in no traditional stat category as in team performance. They ranked six times out of a possible 26 in the top threes of those categories. Like, they were this team that defied genuine analytics and yet still with their their role players with their strategies performed way beyond expectations but they still didn't win you can put yourself in the mix with that blueprint and every now and then you know a team's Someone's gonna have gonna, a magical run they're gonna, and they're gonna do it. the one interesting thing i found is like since the lakers winning a championship a few days ago they've a few of their players i was listening to the jared dudley yeah, podcast it's recently great. it's a very good podcast the um, bill simmons it's, uh, jared dudley on the bill yeah. simmons podcast um a big narrative that they seem the Lakers players seem to be pushing at the moment is their belief that no team could beat them four out of seven times. So I thought that was an interesting way they phrased it. It wasn't necessarily we're going to beat every team four out of seven times. There's no team is going to beat us four out of seven times. And I think the distinction there that I found was that in this, especially in the three point, you know, this three point league that the team, the teams play in, like, Teams can get hot, and a lot of the dialogue in the playoffs was like, "Oh, what if the Mavs get hot for a couple of games? What if the Nug- what if Murray and Jokic get hot for a few games? Like, but yes, it, it can happen, but it's the belief that no against premier top level talent like mm. the Lakers and a strong defensive system which they had, mm. no team is going to get sufficiently hot enough four out of seven times. Mm. I thought that was a really interesting sort of we, narrative yeah. and sort of dialogue that they're promoting. I think also like the heat. It's it's weird to say, but I don't like I don't think it's a stupid thing to remark that they could have taken them to seven. It fully healthy because oh, they thought... took them to six without Dragic, who was their best player in the the, the series mm. before, being injured for all but the last game. Yeah, and when when you tipped the Heat to me before the series, I thought it was plausible. I, I went with the Lakers. Yeah, but it, it, there were a chance, and with without Dragic, it was always going to be hard. But even then, after their like phenomenal. What was it? Would have been game three five, and five. Win. Three and five. Game five win when everyone just everyone had all the analysts had done had written their Lakers championship articles mm. already and basically some of them have basically published it. When they won that, he thought for there was that fleeting moment. Was like, oh yeah, if the Heat could he could make this interesting, you know, if they could get it to a game seven, anything could happen. But yeah, look, the the Heat are going to be a team that a lot of teams are going to try and copy. I think. Yeah. No, I agree. All right, um, that would be you, my yeah. friend. Um, well, because I used my flag on that one, <laughs> Portland, I'm sorry, my thoughts on trading, the necessity of trading CJ McCollum can be canned. Email him. <laughs> um, but I take, I told you I had to talk about Ben Simmons because I always have to. Apparently. My take is that I'm fully convinced that you need to split up Ben Simmons and Joel Embiid, but you have to do it next year and the reason behind that is i think you know the pressure on the philadelphia 76ers organization to get this decision right is unbelievable and you can i think you can compare it a lot to having westbrook and durant for okc earlier in the decade where you you know you strike gold you get these two undeniable talents that are but they just don't fit together on the court and the decision is whether you keep the assets you keep the talent and keep going or do you try and which one do you trade which one do you capitalize on who can get you the right haul at what time which one do you want to build around and i'm not saying they should build around x or y that's probably a different conversation but i think they need to wait one more year because you can't split them up now and then think wow what if we what if it was brett brown you know what if it was 
I think you have to give another coach an opportunity to figure it out. I think you have to give Doc Rivers a chance here. I don't think he's going to figure it out. I don't think it's going to work. I think it's probably going to end the over. exact same it always has. Yeah. But I think you do have to do your like organizational due diligence in a sense and give it one more year. Look, I don't think even if they could figure it out at their best, they're winning. So I agree. Mm. I think it's just... Give it a shot. It's going to fail. Yeah. Trade one. And everyone seems to know it's going to fail. Yeah, everyone does. Everyone does. But you, I still think you just have to wait one more year. Because mm. I don't think either of their trade values are sky high right now either. No, but they're not going to get any worse unless one of them gets injured. Mm. That's It's a it's a plateau. Of yeah. The... They've, they've definitely plateaued. Yeah. That's a good way to describe it. Okay. My next take is that the margin between Nick Nurse... And the next best coach is real in that that man, even though they lost the series against Boston, if you look at the shooting percentages, I would say he he outcoached Stevens because it went to game seven. And I was high on the Raptors. I genuinely thought that maybe if Siakam didn't shoot 12% from the, the three point line in that series, they were, they were going to go to the finals. Um, and I, and I love so much of the Raptors culture, but Nick Nurse is incredible. Like his sets, he was already like, I think there's a lot of people in the media will tell you he's the best coach in the league. I think that was already out there. He won coach of the year. So it's not like this is a groundbreaking statement, but if you think about it merely from an analytics perspective, the game seven point differential was three, one more three pointer falls and I guess two shots fall. And, and they're going to the next round. And, and that was against Brad Stevens, who is, has long been reputed as this elite coach. And I, I, you know, all respect to him, I think he is. But I just, it just reinforced for me that Nick Nurse is really where coaching's going. And I think he's absolutely incredible. I do. He's very much well known for his like experimenting now, isn't he? Throwing out the... Oh, he talks chef. about the box and one, yeah. which is pretty audacious. But, and it uh, worked. I think it helps that he's got such... He's got fantastic pieces around him. As in the players at his disposal. And I love... One thing that we've always liked about the Toronto team is their, their options everywhere. They yeah. can go big. They can go small. That they can go shooting them. lineups. They can go defensive lineups. Mm. I also think, speaking of a team that's kind of plateaued a little bit, I'm not sure where they're going in the next couple of years. But I but, also don't have much fear because their GM... Mm. Um, Masai is, is incredible and, I, and yeah, if you've got the aging roster concerns me a little bit they're going to have to tinker it up a bit but Nurse is is Nurse like he's like 40 something I was going to say is he the most valuable asset that Toronto has look the Siakam thing I'm not ready to completely condemn Siakam um, I get it was a it was a apparently it was a difficult time for a couple of people in the world mm. um, and still young you know 24, 25 still think he's got a heap of value. Um, but, yeah, look, you have to factor in no-shows, always, and his stock probably took a little bit of a hit. But, yeah, just just wanted to, to spotlight that Nick Nurse is really where coaching's going. Yeah. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Over to you. I'll, um, this has unsurprisingly gone way over time, this segment, so I'm going to condense my last two takes into one. And just say that the Western Conference next year is going to be an all-time bloodbath. Really, all-time. Like, some of the years we've heard. Let's look at the Western Conference teams a little bit. Obviously, Lakers and Clippers are still going to be phenomenal next year. Mm. Clippers, absolute disaster this year. But next year, they Redemption still should story. be considered one of the favourites yeah. in the premier teams. Denver... Right where they want to be at the moment, Murray absolutely exploded. We haven't talked about him yet, but he was—he probably changed his standings in the league more than any other player in the bubble. Would you yeah, agree? Who been... who made a bigger jump? If maybe so, Butler, just in, maybe depending Butler. where you put him. Well, but... I mean, in terms of let's say Butler jumped from twelfth to seventh or whatever. Some I'm saying that Murray have... might have jumped up like fifteen places well, or something. So let's say he was at. Th- like what, thirtieth, twenty fifth in the thirties, maybe twenties, forties. I don't. Know. No, no, he would have been late twenties to th- like thirtieth, I think. Roughly. If you look at some of the lists we've yeah. put together, where is he now then, Patrick? He's a top twenty player now, definitely. So, so you think he could potentially be what, like sixteenth, seventeenth? 
Yeah. Okay. Look, I'm not going to dispute it because I don't think I have the mental energy to unpack all of it, but that sounds about right. Yeah. Yeah. My, my point is, Denver are looking fantastic they this are. year as it's, well. It's, I, think, I think I agree with you. I think You've got plenty of teams that are just sort of hanging around as well. Like, the Jazz are going to be good. The Thunder, who knows what can, what's going to happen with them. Let's assume I that faith. I don't think Chris Paul is going to be on their team next year. No, me neither. Let's say he stays. They're going to be in the mix. They're going to be pretty good. You have, um, obviously, we haven't talked about the Warriors coming back next year as well. They're forgot, a playoff forgot team. forgot they existed. Mavs are going to improve next year. I agree. Yeah, this is a good take. Um, so, that, uh, oh, oh, God, I'm bad at maths. That's like six or seven very good teams <laughs> it's there. around that. And then there's, you know, other teams, like, you're going to laugh at this one. Teams like Sacramento, Phoenix, even the Timberwolves are the number one pick. No, no. They're, Take it they're, no, 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 no. Let me, let me finish. They think they're, they <laughs> think they're going to be playoff competing That's teams. It's like when the Cleveland Cavaliers lost LeBron mm. and Tristan Thompson said, we're still going to contend. We're still contenders. Put some respect oh, on our name. that bad. No, no, but just because a couple of dudes think that they're going to be good in the next season doesn't mean mm. that they're contributing to a bloodbath. I didn't even mention the Rockets, by the way. I forgot to talk about them. It, again, it's hard to know. Yeah. They, okay. I, the point is, the West next year, I think, is going to be harder than I can ever remember. Oh, I'm happy to... Conference. Look, let's... I The West has been historically hard for a while, but mm. I can see why you'd say that. Mm. Anyway, we have gone about seven minutes over in this segment, just like you said we would before we started recording. Yeah. Let's, let's go to a break. Good idea. This is a call-out for watch enthusiasts everywhere. The Quick 20 network is growing and we now have our very own watch hobbyist website. So head over and visit thenextwatch.com. That's T-H-E-N-X-T watch.com. With a ton of reviews, features and weekly columns on watches under four figures, thenextwatch.com has it all. Despite the fact that Patrick has argued in our last segment that microball is no longer a thing, micro segments is really looking appealing (laughs) at the moment. I guess what I wanted to talk with you, Patrick, about is the Clippers. Because we both picked them to win earlier on in the season. And so did 70% of the media. I don't right? regret it. No, no, I think it made in sense. In hindsight. Yeah. I, obviously, I wish I could take it back. <laughs> but it made sense. And I stand by believing in that at the time. Yeah, look, I think... I, let's just talk about the implosion. Because mm. who, if you had to blame one person, you never can. But because this is our podcast, who would you? Who, where does it start? Where does the unraveling begin? I'm tempted to say it starts at the top with Kawhi Leonard. You're kidding. But the answer, the answer is Paul George. Yeah, it, it's definitely the Paul George. In fact, I think it goes Paul George, Doc Rivers, because he had no coaching answers for the last three games. No, it was atrocious. And then I think I put Kawhi at like fifth or sixth. Mm. Just because I want to throw a stat out there, even the the game they left the bubble and the, they were eliminated, he was still leading the league in playoff wins over replacement, which effectively means he was incre- He had an elite. Look, look mm. if you look at his numbers, he had an elite playoff season. That doesn't excuse the six for twenty two stat line or the complete fourth quarter meltdown. Yeah, even and his though... his inability to lead the team at all. The leadership is the point. The le- leadership That's where that you can condemn it. Failure. Because, it, I, like, I urge people, and this is someone who just, I'll admit, loves Kawhi. Watch that last fourth quarter again. He wasn't taking a lot of good shots. Which, you know... It, it, but the, and he was taking a couple that he probably should have made and would have made in other games. But also, he was forcing an offense, not because he's James Harden... But because there was no one else willing to take a, sh- a good shot. Yeah. And, and I think his brain had a malfunction where he was like, I've just got to shoot. Mm. And, and, and in that game against Philly, you know, a year earlier, it worked. Yeah. He, made, he went 19 for 30, 39, I think. Yeah. And that's, that's not a great stat line, but mm. in context it is. And I think the issue in that game was he was not... Getting a lot of good looks, mm. and that's 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 praise to Denver. It's reflective of his a wall team. But I don't actually con- condemn Kawhi as much as maybe other people do because one, he's a two-time Finals MVP. It's not like 
he's not capable of performing on the biggest stage. And and two, he was elite in every really every other game in that mm. playoffs. And I think it was just untimely that he had a bad game in game seven. Yeah. It that's, was, it that's was, my take. It was a complete another like institutional meltdown. Yeah. That it, last game. And I think it started with uh, way off P in yeah. in the playoffs. Like we should have known that mm. he wasn't showing up. And really, like you can look at some of his playoff performances in past teams, past years. There's there's a pattern. Mm. He just can't do it for yeah. some reason. He hasn't been out of the first round in years yes. since his Indiana yeah. days. I and believe. I think and I think it was it's just indicative of the fact that for some reason it it afflicted everyone on the team and like we were going through it. I remember I called you straight after that game and we were looking at like Jermichael Green. Yeah. Like seventy percent shooting. He, on he that looks game. like the, he, uh, he the second it. best option on the team. He was a super max player that game. Yeah. He wanted it. And Trez had a good game, finally showed up, but like that Clippers team, we ignored it because of raw talent and mm. the fact that everyone rightly I think to a certain degree believed that Kawhi was the next man to sit on the throne mm. and be the best guy in the NBA. And I'm not I I think it's Highly likely, or not highly likely, I don't think it's that improbable that if they win next season and he's another, he's a three-time finals MVP that we're having a different conversation and we forget about this blunder. But that's, like, I, I think I agree with you. I oh, think it's great, great, great players, like, have flops and in I the finals throughout their... Uh, not in the finals, in the playoffs throughout their career. So I don't in the think, finals as well. Yeah, like, like LeBron, LeBron is... and the Mavs, and we've ever, I'm not going to get into that because yeah. Skip Bayless has talked enough about that yeah. game. But... KD, LeBron, Steph, we've all given them passes for one or two shortcomings, mm. right? I don't. I'm not saying that you know we even need to give him a bona fide pass, but like Kawhi, I'm not worried about him no, next season. I'm worried about everyone else. There are other side. things on that team that yeah. I'm slightly more concerned about. Yeah, I think just watching that collapse was just dumbfounding, and Paul George was absolutely terrible. But I think. The fundamental problem was that they're a team that acted as if the whole regular season they acted as if they once come playoffs they could just flip the switch mm. when only Kawhi had proven that he was capable of doing, doing that. it. And yeah. no one else on that roster has done anything. Yeah, no, and, and Ryan Rosillo like has 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 spoken about this on the Bill Simmons podcast particularly, where they carried themselves like they were a dynasty well mm. established, when in fact there was only really one guy on there that had done it. Yeah, and they hadn't played together that much either. No, they played together for, what, 20, 30 games, fully healthy? And yeah. I think we all, me particular, I'm guilty of this, I saw good numbers and good talent, and I didn't see it. I ignored the fact that it hadn't actually been really tested by anything yet. Yeah. Anyway, we're um, going to go to another break, being true to our micro segments, <laughs> and we'll be back in just a second. Hey, brother. Big fella, I need a fun fact. Fun fact? The Miami Heat are the only fifth-seeded team to reach the NBA Finals ever. That's beautiful. Thank you so much, man. Take it easy. Easy, bro. Ciao. Wait. Thank you, our beloved fun fact guy. It's wonderful to... Pleasure to hear your voice again. Uh, I always say, I feel like, just for some reason, fact and fat... I just want to point out that our fun fact guy doesn't have a weight problem that I know of. <laughs> no. And I'm not, in fact... Not too worried about I'm not that. making any suggestion whatsoever. Yeah. But thank you, fun fact guy. Mm. Wonderful to hear you again. So our final segment, Patrick, is one that we debated having. But, but because it is in the media like wildfire... I feel like we need to offer a small take and I want to do it differently because the media is focused on who the actual GOAT is. Whereas I want to look to you more about how we define the GOAT and the infrastructure of what it is to be a GOAT in this game of basketball. So I'll start with you. Have you been concerned at all about what's going on in the media with this narrative? I, have, I don't even know where to begin. Yeah. On the, the go debate, to be honest. You've got about nine minutes. I, <laughs> I was saying to you this before that I'm so thoroughly sick of having the conversation because I think there's so many people that just have ridiculous opinions on it. I think anyone that's like insanely pro Jordan and anyone that's. Let's not even say their names. Let's not, let's not even say their names. I'll edit that out. I'll put a sound effect over it. <laughs> 
anyone who is completely devoted to one of them yeah. that is like let's call them A and B, A and B, yeah, and is unable to hear any argument to the contrary mm. is just wrong. Like it, it is a discussion. Yeah, it is. You know, whether it's worth having now or later is a different. But when LeBron retires, B, yeah, when B or retires, A or, or A, a. <laughs> one and A or A and one, <laughs> <laughs> so we don't show favoritism. It's it's going to be a conversation that's worth had when he when X retires, mm. and I just think to have this conversation every week, every living, breathing second, every LeBron wins a championship, or every time you know the people when they were saying that the Lakers in the finals ratings were bad, were using that as an example for why Jordan's the goat. Stop <laughs> saying their names. <laughs> it's just Do you know how sound effects I'm going to have to put on. <laughs> I'm I'm just so thoroughly sick and tired of the conversation. I think there's so terrible framing devices for the debate, and I think there's terrible opinions out there. So, to your point, it is getting a little tedious, and I think, even though I believe it's always important to have a goat, because I think you can't really appreciate every great player unless you can really have some framework of evaluating how great that they are, and that just invariably means you need to have a goat. I think, yeah, we need to put on the brakes. Let's give a certain player some time to finish out his career and then we can really compare it. Mm. Because there's a reason why, you know, the Hall of Fame inductions don't happen immediately after someone retires. It's nice to let things sit, Mm. appreciate it. And really, I would urge people when thinking about this one to, yeah, maybe just take a time out and exist without a goat. Because I'm getting to the point now where I'm Mm. like, I'm over this. Yeah. And and you really pioneered that thought in my head. But but two, make a decision about whether or not you're going to synthesize an argument out of the career prospects, mm. culture, how many championships have won, whether or not MVPs, all-star MVPs, all NBAs, whether it's about peak, whether it's mm. about the fact that he remained in the game for X amount of... These things... Cause I feel like different ways of deciding. Mm. And I guess my advice would be, obviously it's always going to be subjective and it's going to come down to majorities and we have ESPN polling for that, thank goodness. Save the day. (laughs) I really want to know what ESPN polls today. I could tell you, but I'm not going to say their names. So I'm just going to tell you that uh, 62% of people believe in Mm. one of them and 32% believe in another. Mm. And then 6% have strange notions about two weeks ago. Okay. Anyway, so that, the I just think the, the infrastructure needs to have a renovation because my goodness, we are we are going far too uh, beyond. We're going beyond sense anymore, mm. and and it shouldn't be about how many space jams you did or yeah. um, anything beyond. I in in my eyes, who touched you know the best person to touch a basketball to display a peak. Mm. And I think you know there's a couple of um, prerequisites in that and delineations in that it has to be for a certain time but for, for me the GOAT debate needs to be about who was the best person to ever touch a basketball mm. that's how I look at it and yeah I think the, the conversation is just far too reactionary as well every little thing that happens and it's major things like LeBron winning a championship or B winning a championship <laughs> I think <laughs> or A <laughs> I think Let's just settle down a little bit. And I hate how the conversation is like, it promotes people to be so damn critical of certain players. Yeah, and we can't, it's such a cliche to say like, oh, appreciate greatness while it's here. Like, I'm sick of hearing that too. Yeah, can we just... But there is a little bit of truth in it. I mean, it has been like We're getting incredible to watch this guy this, this, play. Uh, one of them play, yeah. It's been... Of late. It's been an absolute privilege because he just continues to blow me away time and time again and to get to a point where like being number two all time is kind of a bad thing is is ridiculous ridiculous. exactly yeah like 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 they're both incredible if you offered me a chance to be the top 1500 Mm. 1500th basketball player i'd take it yeah that that puts me as a good basketball player in the nba it's not like you're the goat or you suck yeah. Well, it's the goat or you underwhelmed 
or to the GOAT or you underperformed relative to expectations. Without naming these, you know, couple of players that are vying for this label, Skip Baylor should be ashamed of himself. To put oh, he's the just, day he's just after those paychecks. the day after a certain player won a certain championship of mm. late, to to not even smile and to say little more than congratulations is offensive because mm. this player, even if he's one, two, three, he's Unbelievable. And there's just still years left in this. Yes. I mean... There's going to be... This is... There's going to be the rest over. of his career. Then there's going to be the cooling off period. Mm. The Hall of Fame induction where we talk about how many Hall of Famers he's better than. Mm. There's going to be a couple more subliminal go propagandas launched in certain documentaries that were great, but mm-hmm. a little bit one-sided. And, um... <laughs> and you know there's going to be another documentary coming if, out. If one... If the... If, if the... If the last dance is not... An entire miniseries, but <laughs> the first of many. Yes, <laughs> that'd be awesome. We're gonna have a new last. I want one about years. the wizards, those wizard years, and you know the ones I'm talking about. Let's not forget about. Let's those. do. Let's have a yeah. doc about 2001 to 2003. Maybe wizard uh, years. Big twenty, a uh, quick twenty productions is gonna jump on that. Yeah, yeah we could, we could, we could bid. Yeah, we could bid <laughs> <laughs> against no one. <laughs> Anyway, before we start talking about like doing a doc on the Seattle Supersonics, which should be done by capable hands, I might add, and I'm sure there'll be more of those. Um, Patrick, this could be it for today. Mm. We, I mean, at this point, people will know. I've got nothing left to say about the goat debate. No, I was telling you before, I, I, like when we were planning this, I was going to be completely. I feel like I'm passive aggressive during the debate because I'm that sick of it. It's it just if we could summarize into one sentence to people, mine would be ease up, don't make any rash decisions, maybe even wait it out. Yeah, I completely agree. I'd say let let's just put a hold on this. And let's just let's just enjoy it. Keep, keep things keep things a little bit more it's, calm. Yeah. It's fun that it's still it's even a conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Enjoy it. And also yeah, just appreciate good basketball players. That's what we do here. It is what we do between I, buckets between shading good basketball since 2019 that's that's true yeah mm. anyway i think that's that's it for today patrick wow that's the marathon it, the comeback if this is how lazarus felt then you know lazarus was <laughs> he, did, he did well let's not make sure let's make sure it's not icarus and we're not flying too close <laughs> <laughs> Oh, God. Anyway, once more, everyone who's listening, thank you for your support and your, the time that you give us to ramble on about mm-hmm. Icarus. Congratulations if you made it this far, <laughs> frankly. In fact, if you did make all it... All three of you. If is, you it by his three, a bit too, you know, no, optimistic. If, if all seven of you could like this post that will come with the advertising of this pod, mm. just to let us know you liked it. Or yeah. if you didn't, comment if you didn't, please. But yeah, once again, like us on Facebook, YouTube. I think we're still we really on... We need that we're still on. We're still on Spotify and SoundCloud. Are we? Yeah. Oh, wow. um, for a little while, at least. Yeah. Um, thank you. And please, above all else, basketball aside, take care of yourselves. Stay safe. Be good. Love the little things. Mm. Yeah. There we go. Spurs 2021. No, I'm, I'm editing that out. Good weekend to all of you. <laughs>